On March 1, 1887, the St. Petersburg police arrested three secret society members in Nevsky Prospect for conspiring to assassinate Tsar Alexander III. They were found carrying handmade bombs filled with dynamite and lead pellets poisoned with strychnine. Within three kilometers, on the same day six years earlier, the same organization threw two bombs that killed Tsar Alexander II. Five of the conspirators were captured and hanged. Among them was a 21-year-old student who led the assassination and made the bombs. His execution devastated his mother and drove his 17-year-old brother to pursue the revolutionary struggle ever more fervently. The young man would play a key role in Russia's history. During his long, eventful career, he was known as Ilyin, Tulin, Petrov, Frey. But the name by which he remained best known was Lenin. In the following century, Lenin and his followers changed hundreds of millions of lives. Many revered him, idolized him, and dedicated their lives to his cause. Many reviled him, demonized him, and became part of the Russian diaspora seeking refuge in China. To some, China was nothing but a series of destinations with no meaningful expenses in between. And to many, it had become a place they called home for decades, and the birthplace of some of the most remarkable stories humanity had ever witnessed. And about 70 years later, they disappeared from China overnight. Nowadays, the population of Russian Chinese has dropped 99% to below 5,000. Most people in China and Russia don't even know their existence. This group of people, who epitomized the scars left by the 20th century atrocities of madness, is slowly being forgotten. Some questions must be answered. Who are they? Where are they now? And more importantly, what happened to them? It is a nation which is helping the forces of violence. Khrushchev visited China to renew Soviet support. Mao Zedong denounces the Khrushchev doctrine. We had to shout down with Soviet revisionism. Let on, I was down with Khrushchev. Mutual hostility was escalating dangerously. There were genuine tensions between Russia and China. Premier Zhou Enlai moves forward to greet the first American president to set foot on Chinese soil. In the three years I have been in office, one of my principal aims has been to establish a better relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. I think the Soviet Union uh, is very bad under the rule of the Brezhnev clique. As new Australians in our Australian community, we want to see more of your type coming to these shores. How do you? How do you? I spoke Cantonese before I spoke English. 
I can still say, yet he sam said and looked at bad gals up. In China today, Mikhail Gorbachev became the first Soviet leader in 30 years to sit down with the leaders of China. Together they agreed to normalize the relationship between the two largest communist countries in the world to change things. Зачем на свете это мы живем? Вон цей джига шуде шинхуа кэшама. Боже, вон вэйшимо шинхуа цей джига шуде шинхуа. А мы с тобой прадись пехоты, А летом лучше, чем зимой. Войной покончили мы Russia's involvement in China started 170 years ago. It was begun with unequal treaties signed by the Qing Empire, escalated by the chaos in Russia, dwindled by the Japanese invasion, and terminated by the Cultural Revolution. Before World War II was over, more than 500,000 Russians and Russian-speaking communities would live in China. From the oasis in Xinjiang to the taiga in Manchuria. From the streets of Harbin to the suburbs of Hong Kong. But no matter where they lived and when they arrived, they would quickly find themselves caught at the crossroads of the Russian colonialism, Japanese militarism, Chinese nationalism, and international communism. During their short presence in China, the Russian refugees were involved in one Cold War, two World Wars, three civil wars, four famines, at least five purges, and countless prosecutions and repatriations. For others, they were sojourners seeking refuge in a foreign land that was already full of trouble. For those Russians who left home, time in China was an odyssey, was lives spent resisting, fleeing, adapting, and then fleeing once more. Um, some people think it's very exotic, and some people think nothing. But I, I feel it was a wonderful childhood. It really was. I loved it. The Russian encroachment on China began with the Treaty of Kuja in 1851. Over the next 60 years, the Russian Empire annexed more than 1.54 million square kilometers of Qing territories, the size of four Germanys, built a railway network in Manchuria, a navy port in Dalian, and several Russian cities in both northeastern and northwestern China. 
All of it was administered by Saint Petersburg. From 1900 onwards, Manchuria and northern Xinjiang, while nominally still part of the Qing Empire, started to resemble more and more a Russian province. We're almost in Peking, capital city of China. This is an ancient and highly cultured civilization. So don't get the idea you're any better than these people just because they can't speak English. A few words of Chinese will go. Meanwhile, wars with foreign powers and nationwide rebellions consumed much of the Qing Empire's strength. Famine and diseases gripped most of the country. Tens of millions of civilians are thought to have perished from a combination of massacres, migration, famine, and corpse-transmitted plague. By the early 20th century, Chinese nationalism was on the rise. After failing a promising political reform, the Manchurian rulers finally decided to step down, ending their 268 years of rule over China. When the last emperor of the Imperial Qing Puyi abdicated on February 12, 1912, he was just six years old. In the same year Puyi abdicated, Japan lost Emperor Meiji. The Republic of China was established, and on the same day the Titanic sank, Kim Il Sung was born. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, just weeks before Puyi's abdication, a 41-year-old man formed a party in Prague. His name was Vladimir Lenin. The time for Imperial Russia was running out. On March 15, 1917. Five years after the fall of the Qing Empire, Tsar Nicholas II announced his own abdication. Five days later, the Bolsheviks imprisoned Tsar and his family. On July 17, 1918, after a year of imprisonment in Yekaterinburg, the royal family was awakened around 2 a.m., got dressed, and was led down into a half basement room. The pretext for this move was the family's safety, that anti-Bolshevik forces were approaching. Present with Nicholas, Alexandra, and their children, were their doctor and three of their servants, who had voluntarily chosen to remain with the family. They didn't know a firing squad was waiting in the next room. Nicholas was shot several times in the chest and died instantly. His four daughters survived the first hail of bullets. They were wearing diamonds and gems sewn into their clothing, which provided some initial protection from the shells and bayonets. They were then stabbed with bayonets and finally shot at close range in their heads. Their bodies were driven to nearby woodland, searched and burned. The remains were soaked in acid, and finally thrown down a disused mine shaft. Tsar Nicholas II was 50. His wife Alexandra was 46. Their oldest child was 22, and their youngest. Prince Alexei 
was just 13. No written document has been found on who ordered the executions. But some historians believe it was Lenin. On a summer evening, 44 days after the death of the royal family, Lenin spoke at an arms factory in southern Moscow. When he was about to get in the car, a deranged 28-year-old woman called out to him. When Lenin turned towards her, she fired three shots at him. One bullet passed through Lenin's coat, and the other two struck him. One passed through his neck, the other lodged in his left shoulder. Despite the severity of his injuries, Lenin survived. But his house never fully recovered. It is believed the shooting contributed to the strokes that eventually killed him in 1924. The fate of 137 million Russians and that embattled country rested with another Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin. Between 1897 and 1903, the Russians built a railway in Manchuria using a concession from the Qing government. It was called the Chinese Eastern Railway, the CER. CER provided a shortcut for the Trans-Siberian Railway from the city of Chita to the Russian port of Vladivostok, allowing Russia to settle Manchuria, harvest its resources, and expand trade. With East Asia. The headquarter was in the newly Russian built city, Harbin. Sungarinsky was a symbol of Harbin. This is the Russian city. We are the 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 city. И человек совершенно незнакомый человек. Он знает, что он как бы твой родственник. Слово Харбин для всех нас звучит паролем. Before the construction of the CER, Northern Manchuria was half empty. The site where Harbin was founded in 1898 was occupied by two small fishing villages and an abandoned distillery. CER brought tens of thousands of Russian workers and engineers to Harbin, rapidly developing it into an international metropolis. As the economy grew and the region opened up, the population increased exponentially. A large number of Poles, Armenians, Germans, Georgians, Jews, and Tatars also moved here. Before long, the Russians started to call Harbin the Moscow of the Orient. Things are not bad again in Siberia, and he, he joined the railways, the, the Siberian railways, and he quickly became um, a station master. He married a, 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 a Polish woman. Uh, she was, in fact, a countess. Paul Aroshenko is a Hong Kong-born artist living in Sydney. His father, Ivan Aroshenko, was born in 1890 to a Cossack family. Throughout his life, Ivan was a Bolshevik, first a Leninist, and later a Stalinist. He had fought the Russo-Japanese War in 1905 and World War I in 1917. After he returned from the battlefield, Ivan started working for the railway in the Far East. They, they were very well off, 
um, in the in the railway and so on. <clears throat> and my father had quite a lot of money made up and so on. Because what what you what you don't realize is that uh, China ha had people like England importing uh, opium into China, but there was opium coming via the tra Trans Siberian Railway as well. Anyway, my father told me that what would happen, a train would pull up with 12 carriages, 11 would be full of wheat, one would be full of opium, and he'd have to sign saying 12, 12 wagons of wheat, and it would go. You know, the next day, a man would come along and put a, two suitcases full of money, and my father, because he was a Bolshevik, he would make sure that everybody in that area got paid and so on. But he also, you know, got paid as well. And I asked him, you know, how can you be a, 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 a opium smuggler? And he said, if I didn't do it, they'd kill me. You know, what the hell? You know, you got to live, you know, so it's life, you know. From the second half of the 19th century to the first half of the 20th century, a group of armed robbers and bandits called Hong Hoots looted and harassed every village and railway in Manchuria, Siberia, and Russia's Far East. To protect CER from the Hong Hoots attacks, Russia stationed troops all over Manchuria. But the attacks continued anyway, causing significant damage to the Russian army and local civilians. Like many workers on the railway, Ivan was also attacked. What happened was that um, in that area, there were a lot of uh, warlords and bandits uh, uh, called Hunhuzi. My father, um, there was a local Hunhu, uh, 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 criminal gang, and he used to pay them off so that he was safe from them. But one day they went to raid somewhere else and another group came along and attacked them. Well, what happened was my father, they were having a big garden party. The bandits grabbed him, they tied him to a tree, they tied him up and they started, you know, saying, where's your money, where's your money? And my father says, I haven't got my money. The money is in Harbin in the bank. I don't have any money here. I can't give you any money, it's in the bank. So they started beating him and he still said, no, no, well, it was true, you know, he said, there was no money. Anyway, <clears throat> My father and, and this Polish countess had a son who was about four years old. And uh, the, the, the bandits grab, grabbed him, brought him up and says, if you don't tell us where the money is, we will kill your son. My father says, I can't tell you, it's not here. And the, anyway, they chopped his head and they killed, they killed uh, my, my half brother. On October the 30th, the first military engagement of the Russian Civil War took place. The Bolsheviks' Red Guards faced Cossacks loyal to the recently overthrown government outside Petrograd. Following the death of the Tsar, the civil war in Russia escalated. It led to a mass exodus of refugees, known as the White Russians, who remained loyal to the deposed Tsarist regime and opposed the Red Bolsheviks. To fight the Bolsheviks, Admiral Alexander Kolchak formed the Kolchak government in Omsk, becoming the supreme leader of the White Russians. And he was not fighting alone. A Czechoslovak legion fighting World War I also got in trouble with the Bolsheviks. Я Вера Пацу Пешек родилась и выросла в Китае, северо-восточной части, на берегу реки Сунгари, Сунхватьян, от русской мамы и чешского папы. Разразилась Первая война, и он пошел к солдатам на войну. По своей доле Он мало что рассказывал, только знаю, что он был рядовым шестого полка легионеров. И все они мечтали добраться домой. После Октябрьской революции развалилась 
Австро-Венгрия, то Чехи основали Демократическую республику, и нужны были солдаты, чтобы их защищать. А на Русском фронте там было шесть полков. Initially, the Czechoslovakians were fighting the Germans and Hungarians with Tsar's army in Russia. But in November 1917, the Bolsheviks came to power and seized the war with the Central Powers. The Czechoslovakians fighting on the Russian front found themselves suddenly trapped in Russia. Soon, Bolsheviks blockaded most of the main ports, banning them from re-entering the battlefield. In the end, the Czechoslovakians decided to go to the Pacific port of Vladivostok, sail home from there, and continue the war. On their way to Vladivostok, fighting erupted between Czechoslovak Legion and Bolsheviks. At times, the Legion controlled the entire Trans-Siberian Railway and several major cities in Siberia. In 1917, In the spring of 1919, the Russian Railway Service Corps, a non-combatant unit, commanded by American Colonel John Stevens, was given responsibility for maintaining rail operations along the Trans-Siberian Railroad over which Czech military units were reaching Vladivostok on their troubled journey home. The Allied powers decided to intervene to get the Legion out of Russia. The UK, the United States, Canada, France, Italy, Japan and China all sent troops to Siberia, doing whatever they could to contain the Red Army. Despite the costly effort, the intervention failed to stop the Bolsheviks. In the end, for a safe passage out of the country, the Czechoslovakians handed the white commander Kolchak to the Bolsheviks. More than 60,000 Czechoslovakian soldiers were expected to sail home from Vladivostok, and many chose to wait for their turn in Harbin. By the time Vera's family arrived in Harbin in 1920, some 200,000 white Russians had also arrived. Two years later, the Russian Civil War virtually came to an end. On October 25, 1922, the Bolsheviks took Vladivostok, and Harbin became the final outpost of the White Russians in the Far East. When my mother was only four years old, her father was a White Russian army officer in Harbin, and her mother was the white officer's uh, mistress. And she was apparently a very good looking woman and so on. And they had two children, my mother who was four and a little brother of two. And the, this is during the civil war. My ma maternal grandfather, he was sent to the front and he just disappeared, you know, like 
the war, you know, missing in action. Uh, and my poor old grandmother, she couldn't cope with it, so she hung herself. And what happened was the people gathered around, there was a woman hanging, there were the two little kids there, and a crowd gathered, and a man walked past, saw what was happening. He just picked my mother up, took her home, and said to his wife, we've already got 10 kids, what about bringing up 11? So they brought her up. George Piusky, the son of a lieutenant commander in the Russian Imperial Navy, was born in Odessa in 1910 and moved with his family to Vladivostok in 1911. After the outbreak of World War I, his father was transferred to the West and later was listed as missing in action. When the Bolsheviks took over the city in 1922, many people were taken away from their homes and shot in the basements. George's brother escaped to China, and his mother destroyed all the documents referring to his father as an officer, which at that time implied the enemy of the people. George enjoyed playing music from a young age. So when the Bolsheviks reformed the schools in Vladivostok and started teaching politics to children, he quit school right away and concentrated on music studies. After getting the exit visas, George's family left Vladivostok in 1924. His brother and stepfather got a job at CER, and later George moved to Harbin. Through friends, he was introduced to professional musicians and started his musical career. In the winter of 1924, George got his first job playing for a restaurant. He was 14 years old. And as soon as he managed to save enough money to get a flat, he brought his mother and sister to Harbin. Harbin was not the only haven for the White Russians. Some families boarded the leftover imperial fleets in Vladivostok, circled the Korean Peninsula, and landed in Shanghai as early as 1922. Some tracked through Kazakhstan and made their crossing to northern Xinjiang. The Xinjiang, the largest territory in China, is where the East meets the West. It is home to a number of ethnic groups, including the Turkic Uyghur, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Tibetan. Tajik, Mongol, and Russian. Xinjiang is the site of three Germanies and has long played a key role in Asian history. Its location in the middle of the Asian continent has resulted in a succession of conquerors and traders passing through the area over the last two millennia. For much of that time, it has lain within the Chinese sphere of influence. However, since the expansion of the Tsarist Empire into Central Asia in the 19th century, it has become one of several areas in Asia where the Chinese and the Russians have competed for the allegiance of the local inhabitants. I was born in Urumqi, Xinjiang, which is one of the biggest provinces of China. I have to describe that the beauty of the land and the uh, uh, waters and the little lakes around and surrounding is absolutely gorgeous. And it all began because my grandfather came from Russia in His Majesty's service and unfortunately the after revolution remained there. Somehow the madness of the communist era began when I was only two years of age. Rita's grandfather, Konstantin Dubrovsky, 
was a military doctor under Tsar Nicholas II, and was first sent to capital of Xinjiang, Urumqi, in 1905. He was a good doctor, and the local people loved him. When he finished his mission and returned to Russia, they asked that this doctor be sent to them again. And so, in 1909, Rida's grandfather returned to Urumqi, stayed, and raised a family. He was well known and respected among the locals, not only as a great doctor. He also organized the building of many homes where White Russian refugees were settled. By 1922, every city in northern Xinjiang had a sizable White Russian population. Some settled down, and others hoped to retake Russia when the timing was right. The collapse of the Qing Empire in 1912 left a power vacuum that spread across China. Regional military factions started fighting each other over the control of the country. Unlike the Russian Civil War, China's power struggle lasted nearly 16 years. During China's warlord age. Local military cliques welcomed the White Russian soldiers. They joined the war as senior officers, commanders, and even mercenaries, who knew modern warfare far better than the Chinese soldiers. Warlords in Xinjiang and Manchuria were especially keen on winning their allegiance. The object of this revolutionary movement is to carry out the principles enunciated by our great leader, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, known as the Three Peoples Principles. The warlord age ended in December 1928, when the Chinese Nationalist Party under Chiang Kai-shek officially unified China. Are that the people will have power to govern themselves, the right to live for themselves, and the meaning of getting a livelihood for the people. 就是要建设我们一个民有、民治、民享的新的中国。In the early hours of June 8, 1928, six months before Chiang's unification of China, warlord Sun Lianying led his army into the Eastern Mausoleums, the final resting place of the Qing emperors and empresses. Some of the most influential rulers of China, such as Emperor Shun Zhi, Kangxi, Qianlong, and Empress Dowager Cixi. Were all buried there. Under the command of Sun Dianying, his troops looted and vandalized everything they saw. The coffins of Emperor Qianlong, his empress, and four concubines were pried open. All the valuables looted, and soldiers threw the skeletons into the mud. The news quickly reached the last emperor Puyi. He was livid. In his memoir, he wrote, "I 心里燃起了无比的仇恨怒火，走到阴森森的灵堂前，当着满脸鼻涕眼泪的宗室人等，向着空中发了誓言，不报此仇，便不是爱新觉罗的子孙。我此时想起普伟到天津和我第一次见面时说的，有普伟在。”大清就一定不会亡。我也发誓说，有我在，大清就不会亡。我的复辟复仇的思想，这时达到了一个新的顶峰。When Pu Yi was later told that Sun sent some of the booty to Chang's new bride Song Mei Lin, and the pearls from Empress Cixi's phoenix crown became decorations for Madame Chang's shoes. 
he was overwhelmed by anger. Up to the present, the women of China have lived a more or less sheltered life. They have been noted for their patience, their modesty, their self-sacrifice, and their ability to efface themselves. In other words, up to the present, the relationship between the Qiang government and the last Qing emperor ruptured completely. Soon, the 22-year-old Pu Yi started talking to the Japanese, who promised to help him restore the kingdom. Chiang Kai-shek paid little attention to this, and he would regret it. After decades of war and chaos, two new regimes had replaced Imperial Qing and Imperial Russia. The Republic of China, ROC, led by Chiang Kai-shek, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, led by Joseph Stalin. Like their predecessors, they didn't get along. In September 1920, ROC announced that it would no longer recognize the Russian consulates in China and deprive Russians of extraterritorial rights. Overnight, the Chinese government took over every institution in Harbin, and Russians in China found themselves suddenly stateless. Meanwhile, consular officials in Xinjiang had roughly two weeks to prepare for their closure, and all faced a very uncertain future. Buildings, furniture, and papers were left in the custody of the Chinese. At the same time, Bolshevik efforts to surprise white forces continued. The combined White Army and the Chinese Army detachments liquidated many remaining white units in Xinjiang. On May 17, 1921, the first Xinjiang governor, Yang Zhengxin, authorized the Red Army to enter Xinjiang to destroy all remaining white forces, which continued to launch provocative and destructive cross-border raids. Not having enough troops to wipe out the white gangs, the Chinese government agreed to allow Red Army units to cross the border into Chinese territory for joint action against the white generals. After this action, Red Army units would immediately be strong. In return for military assistance, China agreed to supply Soviet forces with food and transport. After encountering increasing hostility from the local authorities and Red Army, white troops were demobilized altogether, some becoming tradesmen some farmers, and others even bandits. By the end of 1921, most organized white offensive operations had ceased, but the whites still remained a force in Xinjiang. Three years later, in 1924, the Republic of China and the USSR signed an agreement in Beijing regarding the ownership of the CER. The agreement stated that the CER could employ only Soviet and Chinese citizens. This meant the Harbin Russians had to choose not only their nationality, but also their political identity. In the end, many Harbin Russians applied for a Soviet passport to keep their jobs. 
Gradually, the national and political identity of the Harbin Russians split the group into opposing sides, which led to a strong Soviet presence in Harbin. As the tension built up among the Harbin Russians, the tension between the two nations was reaching a fever pitch. In July 1929, the de facto ruler of Manchuria, warlord Zhang Xueliang, held a meeting with Chiang Kai-shek, at which a decision was made on the armed seizer of the CER. Zhang Xueliang believed that the capture of the CER would strengthen his position in Manchuria, allow him to manage the profits of the CER personally, and ensure his independence from Chiang. Within the same months, the Chinese army seized the CER. The Soviet Union quickly responded with a military retaliation against ROC. Stalin sent approximately one in five Soviet soldiers to the front line, the largest Red Army combat force fielded before the Soviet Union joined the Second World War. The Chinese army and some 3,000 white Russian soldiers didn't stand a chance. After nearly five months of fighting, the USSR forced the ROC to the negotiation table and returned the CER to joint administration. However, the impact of this conflict was dire and everlasting. After the Chinese lost the war, Manchuria was in a power vacuum, which left the door wide open for the Japanese to take control in the next few years. In addition, Stalin started to grow suspicious and hostile toward Asians in the Far East and the Russians in China, labeling them as undesirable people. Japan's growing influence over the region also worried Stalin. Eventually, under the pretext of national security, Stalin decided to relocate all the Asians of the Far East, Darwars, Chinese, Koreans, Mongols, and other Asian peoples were all forced to evacuate. There was no escape. <laughs> to achieve this, Stalin employed the newly completed Turkestan Siberia Railway, which connected Central Asia with Siberia. From 1926, to 1937, around 5,500 Chinese were transferred to Central Asia. 3,932 were killed, and at least 12,000 Chinese and their families were relocated to the Xinjiang city of Tarbakhti. Most of them had married Russians. Uh 现在就找到了我的老老和奶奶是纯俄罗斯族 Ivan Novanagia was local people's congress representative in Tarbakhti. In the 1930s, Stalin relocated her grandparents from the Far East 
Nadia's parents were born in the Soviet Union, but her paternal grandfather was Chinese from Wuchao, and her maternal grandfather was also Chinese from Luoyang. They traveled far away from their hometowns to make a living, never expecting to marry a Russian wife or be transferred to Xinjiang. In total, Stalin relocated more than six million undesirable people. One million died during the relocation. I remember they were talking in the evening. За ними пришли работники НКВД и дали полчаса на сбор, сказали собрать, взять с собой ну, документы и продукты питания, первые предметы первой необходимости. Потом всех построили и посадили на товарный вагон и отправили в Узбекистан. Nikolai Tan, an ethnic Korean born and raised in Uzbekistan, heard from his parents about their relocation. По их рассказам, они где-то ехали в Узбекистан. Ну, там условия были очень тяжелые, потому что у многих, ну, еда кончилась, пить, воду давали не всегда. Особенно много умирало в пути. Это э, маленькие дети и старики, пожилые и старые женщины. Ну, мамы, мои мамы, родители э, сами почти ничего не кушали и не пили. Они отдавали детям. И поэтому от истощения они умерли по пути. И ну, времени не было хранить их. И только это охранники э, уже мертвых их оставляли в сугробах возле железнодорожной насыпи. As Stalin relocated the undesirable people, a famine graved most of the country. Nishanjinya 那除了除此之外反正就有一条那个杨或者一只羊有一头牛都都都那么一点就算是很穷的一点点有不算为不行就把他们呃要么安排到西伯利亚那儿就把他们移到那儿过去现在不听话的就处理掉就压力比较大这
，因为我爷爷那时候啊，文革的时候不敢讲这些，讲多了害怕有啥问题，所以那时候不说这些事情，所以父亲也少问这些，所以就很具体具体的事情，嗯、呃。好像是西伯利亚是肯定的事情，好像是奥伦多那一块的。Nikolai Ivanovich Lunyev, the headmaster of the Yining Russian School, was born and raised in Xinjiang. He belongs to the last pure Russian family in Yining, and the last Russian-speaking community in China. Ah,、uh, 这样子，呃、uh...。他是从中央俄罗斯中央开始这些政策，呃，刚开始在俄罗斯搞搞这些集体农庄，那时候我爷爷跑到哈尔滨啊，就远一点跑了，正好我我我父亲就是在哈尔滨出生的，在那里也待过，好像是五年嘛多少，然后在这里也开始了，也开始了，干脆跑到中国来了。呃，我爸爸三岁的时候就来到中国，我也就来了，就算是一带一过，一带一过，我就在中国生长的。Unlike the Manchurian Russians who had to choose between a Soviet passport and no passport, Xinjiang Russians were offered a third choice. Becoming naturalized Xinjiang citizens. In 1928, Russians who moved or fled to Xinjiang could apply for a residence permit or go through naturalization. Because, unlike Manchuria, Xinjiang's economy primarily relied on trade with Russia. For much of its history, Xinjiang was almost inaccessible from China proper. The Tarim Basin and the Taklamakan Desert are famous for being vast and deadly. Before 1935, there was no automobile road connecting Xinjiang with China proper, and merchants still used camels in the Silk Road to transport goods. Between 1927 and 1935. The Swedish explorer Sivan Hedin led a Sino-Swedish expedition in Mongolia, the Gobi Desert, and Xinjiang. From 1927 to 1932, Sivan led the tour from Beijing to Mongolia, trekking through the Gobi Desert and northern Xinjiang, and arrived in the northeastern part of the Tarim Basin. When he finally arrived in Urumqi on February 27, 1928, Hidin and his crew were cordially welcomed by the Xinjiang governor Yang Zhengxin, who granted all of Hidin's expedition and academic requests. The two quickly became friends. Sivan Hidin admired the governor and was grateful for his help. Yang, a great enthusiast of Western technology and culture, enjoyed talking to Hidin. Before his quick return to Europe, the old governor asked him to bring back ten model cars, a pair of pistols, a telescope, and two Swedish mechanics who could speak Russian and repair his model cars. Sivan Hedin promised to do his best. Yang would not live to see any of those items he had requested. Two months after Hedin's departure, the old governor was murdered. He was shot three times in the head, and twice in the heart. From the end of 1933 to 1934, He Ding, on behalf of Chiang Kai-shek, led a Chinese expedition to investigate irrigation measures, and more importantly, draw up plans and maps for the construction of two roads suitable for automobiles along the Silk Road. From Beijing to Xinjiang, I have undertaken a long journey to the interior of Asia, 
and more especially to the great province of Xinjiang for the purpose of tracing and locating new highways, new uh, motor car roads, uh, bringing the province of Xinjiang much nearer to China proper. Now the caravans go there in three months from China proper to Xinjiang. If you have a, a motor car road, you can do it easily in 10 days. And that's very important from commercial and financial point of view. Following his plans, the Chinese government constructed major irrigation facilities, and roads were finally built on the Silk Road from Beijing to southern Xinjiang, which made it possible to bypass the rough terrain of Tarim Basin altogether. In comparison, Russians had virtually no difficulties reaching Xinjiang. The Kazakh steppe is the largest dry steppe region on Earth, extending more than 2,200 kilometers from the area east of the Caspian Depression all the way to the Altai Mountains. It is easy to travel through and perfect for the Russians to build roads and railways. From Xinjiang capital, Urumqi, to the nearest Soviet railway station, Ayagold, the distance was 950 kilometers. To the nearest Chinese railway station, Baotou, the distance was more than doubled to 2,340 kilometers. To the governors of Xinjiang, the Turkestan Siberia Railway brought trade and technology from USSR. Because of their connection with the Soviet Union, Russians in Xinjiang were strategically important to sustain the local authorities. In 1931, trade with Soviet Union amounted to 80% of the provincial total, while China only made up 15%, and British India, 5%. In 1926, Yang Zhengxin appointed a Russian as the head of the Xinjiang Provincial Highway Bureau. Yang also hired Russian automobile drivers and repair technicians from Manchuria and Tianjin, held training courses for drivers and repair workers, and trained the first drivers and repair crew in Xinjiang's history. In 1933, Sheng Shicai became the third governor of Xinjiang. At the first People's Congress held in Xinjiang that year, representatives of the ethnic Russians attended the meeting under the name of Naturalized People. In 1935, at the Second People's Congress of Xinjiang, delegates officially added the Russians to the ranks of the 13 native ethnic groups living in Xinjiang. As Russian population grew exponentially, the espionage war between whites and whites also intensified. My father was the second husband of my mother. Before that, she was married to uh, Count Poltavsky, and she was only 15 years of age when she married him. During her time, she realized that the, the Count was somehow, the behavior of his nature became very, very, uh, uh, different from the original behavior when he married her. So my mother decided to find out what is actually her husband, that's mean the first husband was doing. She tiptoed to his office at night. He always used to go and only work at night, never during the daytime. And behind his back she stood and she decided to find out all the details, what was going on. And for her awful dismay and shock, she discovered that the list of all the people, especially those who were against the communist era and a communist judgment and a communist Soviet Union regime, he put it everything in writing and which was latest was sent to Russia. And I believe it was actually Moscow that has been sent into it to identify all the so-called against the communism regime 
Russian, as they used to call the white Russians, and should be exterminated, including the Tartars, the Mongols, Shivins, and Chinese, who also were against the Russian regime. The world today is passing through the most tremendous period of readjustment that mankind has seen, and a real desire to do away with war is being manifested. Peace on earth and goodwill towards man can only be accomplished by the mutual respect and understanding of one nation towards another. Princess De Ling was born in 1881 and spent most of her early life in Japan and Europe. When her family returned to China, she became the first lady in waiting and the interpreter to Empress Dowager Cixi. De Ling stayed at the court until 1905. After the fall of the Qing Empire, she moved to California and taught Chinese at UC Berkeley. I am grieved that this side of Chinese life is very little known here. Although China is a very old country, she is a young republic. She is striving mentally to develop and become up to date. This will take time, but the Chinese flutter. While Princess De Ling had high hopes for the young republic, the head of the royal clan had a different idea. Four years after Princess De Ling's speech on television, the last emperor of China, Pu Yi, shocked the world once again by becoming the first emperor of Manchu Core. He was 28. Now I have great pleasure to have this opportunity of extending my greetings to the world through the medium of the talkie. I fully realize the fact that the world at large has yet know little about the fact The year was 1932, after a brief war with the Republic of China. Japan swept over Manchuria and formed a new nation called Manchukuo, the country of Manchuria. Pu Yi, unlike Tsar Nicholas II, was back on the throne. As Manchukuo celebrated its new ruler, the renegade warlord Zhang Xueliang was livid and accused Japan of separating Manchuria from China. For many years, Japan has opposed China's unification and economic progress. For selfish, since he has tried to tell other nations that Manchuria is not part of China. Shortly after, the League condemned Japan as an aggressor nation. The Japanese, on the other hand, insisted that the capture of Manchuria was for peace and prosperity in East Asia. It is a matter of common knowledge that Japan's policy is fundamentally inspired by a genuine desire to guarantee peace in the Far East and to contribute to the maintenance of peace throughout the world. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the report adopted by the Assembly. In answer, 
The Japanese delegates, knowing there were no guns behind this condemnation, smiled, took up their briefcases, marched out of the league. Manchuria was dead. Collective security was dead, and the green light had been given to the aggressors. Japan never got along with Russia. The anti-Russian sentiment was widespread since their very first contact in 1855. During Nicholas' first visit to Japan in 1891, a Japanese policeman attacked him with a katana, leaving a nine-centimeter-long permanent scar on the face of the future Tsar. Nicholas would have been killed if his cousin Prince George didn't block the second strike. The tension between the two empires escalated at the turn of the century, as Japan slowly established economic and military dominance in Korea and Manchuria. The Russians also began to make inroads into Korea, growing its influence over the same region. In 1904, the Russo-Japanese War broke out. The victory was so overwhelming that Japan won every battle, occupied Korea, took Port Arthur, and sank most of the Tsar's fleet in the Battle of Tsushima. For the first time in centuries, a nation power had defeated a Western one. My father, who was 15, uh, was a, a, a boy soldier in that war.、Uh, he 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 was belonged to a Ukrainian regiment, but his job as a 15-year-old was to be a messenger. He had to run backwards and forwards from headquarters to the to the front and so on.、Uh, anyway, he was sent with a message to the headquarters. By the time he tried to get back, the Japanese had encircled his Ukrainian regiment.、Uh, the Ukrainian Ukrainian regiment refused to surrender, but in the end, the Japanese wiped them out. And they also, they, you know, they mutilated the bodies and so on. So my father, all his life, he hated the Japanese. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't hate the Japanese, even though, you know, the awful things happened to us. But you know, I, but he, he never ever、uh, forgave the Japanese for things like that. In August 1905, U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt invited both sides to a peace conference. He hammered out an agreement called the Treaty of Portsmouth. Each side could claim some kind of victory. Russia abandoned all claims to Korea. Japan dropped its demand for payment for the cost of the war. And the disputed island of Sakhalin was split in two. For his efforts. Roosevelt was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, the first American to win any Nobel Prize. However, 
the Japanese were not pleased. Nationwide protests began as soon as the news of the treaty reached Japan. A two-day riot took place in Tokyo. In the end, the Japanese government had to declare martial law to restore order. The riot ended with 17 people dead, over 2,000 people arrested, and the resignation of Prime Minister Katsura Taro. But the bitter grudge against the Russian regime. Did not go away. In 1932, when Manchuria was conquered, the most popular song in Japan was called "Manchuria March," whose verses proclaimed that the seizing of Manchuria was a continuation of what Japan had fought against Russia in 1904. The ghost of the Japanese soldiers killed in the Russo-Japanese War could now rest at ease, as their sacrifices had not been in vain. Germany in Europe. And Japan and Asia sign a pact against communism. For the Japanese, the only thing that dwarfed their anti-Russian sentiment was their anti-communism sentiment, and the Soviet Union happened to be both. Germany and Japan, who are not prepared to tolerate these activities any further, have now taken action. The agreement. Between Germany and Japan, against the Communist International, signed today. Troubled with nationwide famine and power struggle, Stalin was not ready for a war with Japan. He chose to back down and established diplomatic relations with Manchukuo. Suddenly, Harbin Russians found themselves living under the rule of Japan. Harbin's city is visible. まもなくモダンなハルピン駅に到着。人口およそ50万人の北満州の中心都市ハルピン。大連からアジアで一直線に来れば12時間半である。東のモスクワ、パリとも言われたエキゾチックな国際都市ハルピン。もともと消火口に臨む一漁村に過ぎなかったこのハルピンが発展したのは、19世紀末にロシア人が入ってきて、町を建設し始めてからだった。したがってハルピンにはロシア人が多く住み、その文化を色濃く残していた。最も異国情緒に溢れているのがこの北イスカヤ通りである。洒落た店が立ち並び。看板はロシア語、満州語、日本語の三通りで書かれていた。ロシア人の花屋が通りに明るく華やかな色彩を添えている。Negative emotions prevailed in the attitudes of Harbin Russians among the Japanese. There were unhealed wounds of the Russo-Japanese War. And the fear of Manchukuo secretly being communized by the Soviet Union was growing day by day.
Они поголовно хотели объяпончить всех. Там очень сильная русская православная церковь. Mm -hmm. У нас было 13 огромных церквей. Там все духовенство было сосредоточено. И японцы позвали митрополита и сказали, что наша обязанность поставить в наши православные храмы богиню Аметерасу Омиками, ей их богиню. Ну и наши все эти, они говорят, мы лучше здесь умрем, чем такое. Если бы мы, хорошо ответил, можно вас спросить, если мы нашу Богородицу поставим в ваш храм, что скажут ваши верующие? И они пошли на попятную, и уже этого больше не требовали. Under the Japanese reign. Harbin Russians quickly developed into two opposing communities. The Soviet Russians and the stateless Russians. The Japanese regime officially favored the stateless Russians, but in reality, they were not trusted either and were exposed to a great risk of being arrested as Soviet spies. As for the Soviet Russians, the Japanese often confiscated their property and their kids were excluded from all Russian schools in Manchukuo. Regarding the sale of Chinese Eastern Railway to the Manchurian Empire by Soviet Russia, three years after the establishment of Manchukuo, USSR sold CER to the Japanese, withdrawing much of its influence from Manchuria. It has, ever since its construction, occupied a conspicuous place on the stage of international rivalries in Eastern Asia. If its sale proves a permanent contribution to the cause of peace, we have every reason to look upon the operation with favor. Here, as elsewhere, the interests of all nations are the interests of lasting peace. Peace didn't last long in Harbin. The sale of CER in 1935 left many jobless, and a great number of Harbin Russians with Soviet passports decided to return to USSR, hoping to visit their friends and families and settle down. However, things were not going the direction they imagined. Because when the Japanese believed Harbin was harboring a lot of Soviet spies, the Soviets believed Harbin was harboring a lot of Japanese spies. After the bandits killed his son, Ivan Aroshenko went to America for 10 years building the Hoover Dam and other construction projects. At the end of 10 years, he made some money, divorced, realized that he was still a great admirer of Stalin, and decided to return to the Soviet Union to help his idol. So he made his way all the way back to Harbin. He went to Harbin and went to the Soviet consulate there. And luckily for him, the Soviet consul was an old friend of his. And the Soviet consul said, Vanyushka, the little John, the little Ivan, you know, says, Tavarish Stalin, Comrade Stalin, doesn't trust anybody who's been in America. So if you go to the Soviet Union, you will be sent to the Arctic Circle, where it is so cold, your teeth will drop out. So my father said, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, so then he was there, see? And anyway, at this stage, he was 50, and he didn't know what to do. Ivan was lucky not to return. Since September 20th, 1937, all Harbin Russians who returned to Soviet Union were intercepted and repressed by NKVD Order Number 593, the Harbin Operation. NKVD, Stalin's secret police, was the largest intelligence service in the world. Its agents were highly professional and brutal. 
and their primary mission was to serve Stalin and destroy his enemies both at home and abroad. The order stated that of 25,000 registered Harbin Russians, the majority were former White Guards, spies, fascists, former policemen, and worked for the Japanese intelligence service. Families of the arrested Harbin Russians were to be prosecuted by NKVD Order Number 486. The repression of the family members of traitors to the motherland. Wives were imprisoned in labor camps for at least five to eight years, and their children were orphaned. According to the data collected by Memorial, 48,133 Harbin Russians were repressed, of which 30,992 were shot. The news of returned Harbin Russians being executed quickly reached China. And from that point on, Harbin Russians, with or without Soviet passports, dare not return. Many Russians couldn't take it anymore and started moving to the southern cities with international concessions, such as Beijing, Tianjin, Qingdao, and Shanghai. For many stateless Russians, international concessions were the safest place to live. In 1937, Stalin's purge also reached Xinjiang and the arrest of white Russian leaders began. One night my mother was sitting and sewing because she was a perfect seamster and my grandfather has arrived. The arrest and the, the madness of the communist regime already began much more advanced than it was before. And when my grandfather came in, he said to my mother, I came here just to tell you that I have a feeling that something dreadful, something absolutely destructive will happen in this land. Three days later, citywide arrests began. Soviet agents arrested Rita's father and grandfather, accusing them of taking gold out of Russia. They held them in prison, tortured them, beat them, and killed them. Under NKVD Order Number 486, the rest of the family, Rita, Rita's mother, grandmother, and sister, were also put into jail. They were imprisoned in Korla for two and a half years. And I still remember very well, there was a big, huge room to which were all the women and children being tucked in. There were no beds, there were nothing, there were no chairs. All we had was the floor the ceiling and the, and the walls. And I still remember also, as a matter of fact, there were two little windows on the top, so whatever lights that we were getting through it, that's what we had. When we have arrived there, the whole situation is impossible to explain. However, I, I also do remember there was a lot of tears and sickness and despair in the people's attitude and whatever they were trying to do just to make easier because the people who were actually the guards who were looking at the, at the whole people trying to put them in, in those little rooms or barracks were so brutal and the screams were brutal as well. That I still can remember although I was about two years of age. So when we came into this room, and there was about at least 30, 40 people I dream uh, could have been, all what my mother finally found, a little spot on the corner, and she managed to put her little sister there and us with my grandmother. So we said that in that prison camp, under those conditions, we existed for about two and a half years. The head of the jail, a Mongol, knew Rita's mother, grandfather, and grandmother. He gave them actual rations. Later, that Mongol snuck Rita's family out of the prison 
loaded them onto a truck, and sent them to Kuja. George moved around frequently during those years. In the summer of 1925, the 14-year-old left Harbin for Mukden, and after he finished his contract in the winter of 1926, he boarded the train to Beijing and started playing for two nightclubs, Alcazar and the International. At about the same time, the American paleontologist Roy Chapman Andrews, the man who inspired Indiana Jones, and Sivan Haydin were both living in Beijing, researching the Peking man. Alcazar and the International happened to be where they usually met for drinks. Since there is an overlap in time and space, Sivan Haydin and Roy Chapman Andrews had likely heard him play. After three and a half years away in Mukden and Beijing, George returned to Harbin for eight months. Afterward, he moved back to Beijing for another three years. He and his family lived in Kuijiachang Hutong, home to many foreigners in the 1930s. The working place was less than two kilometers from where he lived, a German hotel called Hotel du Nord situated just outside the legation quarter, next to Hataman. In 1933, just before he turned 23 years old, George left Beijing for Qingdao, once a German colony, then a Japanese colony, and the summer port of the U.S. Asiatic fleet in the early 1930s. He spent seven weeks there and played at Qingdao Cafe, Then he left for Shanghai, to Paris of the East. Russian aristocrats. Their titles are absolutely genuine. Their parents escaped to Shanghai during the Russian Revolution. Shanghai was a nasty place in those days. An international settlement run by seven nations. Because they had no country, their life was worthless. They could be robbed, murdered, nobody bothered. Charlie Chaplin who wrote and directed the film The Countess from Hong Kong in 1967, said the film was a result of his trip to Shanghai in 1931, where he came across a number of titled aristocrats who had fled from the Russian Revolution. They had no money, no country, and the situation was worse. The men worked as rickshaw, and the women, dancers, pensions for them. I understand you're born in Shanghai. Yes, but my parents came from Russia. And now they've moved to Hong Kong. My parents died in Shanghai when I was 13. Haven't you any brothers or sisters? I was an only child. 13, a little young to face the world. We must all face it sooner or later. Some more sooner. Despite their dire situation, Russian refugees carried on and played an important role in Shanghai. In 1914, about 100 Russians were living in Shanghai. By 1918, the number had risen to over a thousand. At the end of 1924, it was 8,000. Early in 1936, it was 25,000. Most of them arrived in Shanghai penniless, knowing neither English nor Chinese. It was very, very slowly that the ever-growing Russian community managed to become self-supporting. And even then, 
It had to be content with a standard of living far below that demanded by other foreigners. The women became nurse girls, cinema attendants, shop assistants, and professional dancing partners in the city's numerous cabarets and dance halls. The men became chauffeurs, policemen, mechanics, tram inspectors, night watchmen, and even bodyguards for wealthy Chinese. The Foster family treated Paul's mom very well. They taught her dressmaking skills so she could someday live on her own. When she turned 17, her foster parents looked around to find her a husband. Paul's father, Ivan Aroshenko, who had just returned to Harbin from the United States, was 50 years old. He was single and well off. There was my father who was 50 and so on, and they thought he was rich. So they thought that it would be a good idea to marry my mother, who was only 17, to a rich old man, but then he would look after her. So they did. They married her off. My father thought it was a great idea. I said to him once, uh, you know, why? You're 50, you know, she was 17. You know, why, why did you marry someone so young? And he, he said to me, I much prefer the smell of perfume to that of liniment. <laughs> So, so anyway, but unfortunately what happened was that my father, he did have quite a lot of money. When he was in America, he was warned to that there was going to be an economic crash, a stock market crash. So he took all his money out of the American stock market and he transferred it to the Japanese stock market. But then when he was getting married to my mother in Harbin, the Japanese stock market crashed. So my poor old mother, instead of marrying a rich old man, she ended up marrying a poor old man. <laughs> so she was very unlucky in life, you know. So and then they they went uh, first, they went for the honeymoon to Tianjin. And then later on, they moved to Shanghai. And Shanghai was uh, a place that was very welcoming to all sorts of people in those days. You know, like a lot of Jewish people escaped from Nazi Germany, went to Shanghai and so on. So Shanghai was uh, welcoming, you know, uh, so it, it was a very cosmopolitan place. Uh, but the Chinese Communist Party was born in Shanghai, you know, so it was, it was, it was a place for all kinds of ideas. So a lot of Russians went there and they had to, they had to work out how to survive. You know, a lot of them were military people, so they became bodyguards for rich Chinese and so on. That was, that was how they survived. In the 1930s, the Shanghai Mafia boss, Du Yuesheng, hired three white Russian bodyguards for his three sons. One of them was called Konstantin Tiluv. The people at the Du mansion couldn't pronounce it. So based on the Shanghainese pronunciation, they decided to call him Gangsu Song Jinu Fu, which means the city of Jinan in Jiangsu province, an imaginary place that is not on the map. Tiluf had a great relationship with everyone in the Du Mansion. He was responsible, polite, fluent in Russian and English, and diligent in self study. The mafia boss liked him very much. Tiluf also did a great job protecting the boys. When the brothers wanted to go to the public bathhouse, Tiluf would come along, bathe with them, dry the pistol several times, and always keep it within reach. Gradually, with self-help and mutual assistance, many Russians had successfully set up small enterprises of their own. In the French concession, there used to be hundreds of small Russian businesses on Avenue Joffrey. Some last till this day. Eileen Chang, one of the most influential writers in modern China, was born in Shanghai in 1920. In her girlhood years, she witnessed the arrival and departure of the Shanghai Russians. Lingo 
有一种特别小一眼，半球形，上面留有眼竖皮，下面底上开了一只半寸宽的十字托子，搿十字大概面饿得比较硬，里向穿了眼奶酪，肥海，伊勿大甜的面包铜吃，微妙可口。And like many upper-class Shanghainese girls, Eileen Chang also took piano lessons from whitewashing teachers. 我进中学前头啊，有一趟钢琴老师在海伊屋里向开音乐会，随着伊的乐声演奏，尺度不小。比方介绍我去的我一个表娘娘，不是老小姐，也已经是半老小姐，但个也一够资格。自家做了会堂表演，上报扬名了。哥帮我弹个一支，拍子又美，又没曲调可以，又不得脚踏板，显得幼稚。似乎事实分明的水平调非常的不讨好，弹光了也没啥人拍手。但是我看了看我朋友女老师，略点略点头，也就放心了。Chikalian's owners had long left Shanghai, but his food stays and becomes the memory of millions of Shanghainese. Eileen's piano teachers had all passed away, but letting children learn piano has become a trend for all Chinese middle-class families. Nowadays, 40 million Chinese children play pianos every day. With the growth of a Shanghai-educated generation speaking and writing English and possibly Chinese as well as Russian, the Russians were making their way into offices and professional circles. The depression also helped improve the lives of the Russian refugees, which compelled foreign firms to reduce expenses drastically. They started to replace men brought out from home with local Russians. Who were willing to accept a quarter of the salary and did not expect home leave paid by the firm. In the same way, Russian stenographers replaced English and American girls in offices. The depression had also helped the Russian professionals: the doctor, the dentist, the architect, the engineer. Many had been struggling for years to establish themselves, and now, with their lower scale of charges, they were attracting patients. Who formerly patronized the expensive English, French, or Americans? Shanghai Russians not only maintained their national identity and self-respect, but also saved themselves from the abyss of destitution and social degradation that threatened to engulf them. Twelve days after arriving from Qingdao. George started playing at the Dutch Village Inn. A year later, he began to play for Saint George's Hotel, one of the best and most luxurious hotels in Shanghai. He was 24 years old. One summer evening, a young lady with beautiful brown eyes went to Saint George's with friends. While she was dancing with her date at the time, George saw her. And was instantly smitten. Her name was Lila. The young musician's life was about to change completely, and so was everyone's life in China. The Empire of Japan was only two years away from launching an all-out attack on China. Meanwhile. In a remote Tibetan village of Sichuan Province, a group of young revolutionaries fleeing from Chiang Kai-shek were about to have an even greater impact on this land in the years to come. And every Russian in China, willingly or not, was going to be involved.